Okay, well, I've already kind of broken ground on this subject by looking at several passages. And again, let's remember the primary passage. Uh, actually, it's going to be repeated in our text this morning. And it's quoting, uh, the author to the Hebrews is quoting uh, David from Psalm 110. And uh, it, it reminds us of the promise that the Father has given to the Son, that for the work that He has done, you know, not only does He give Him a people to be His, you know, His peculiar possession, to be His brethren, um, that He may lead in the worship of, of God forever, but He also has given Him a promise that all of His enemies are going to be defeated, placed under His feet. That's what that means. So that's what we're looking at. Christ is, is reigning as King. And during this time of his rule, his enemies are being subdued. And that should make a difference, I believe, in the world, in what we see in the world, what we should expect to see in the world. So let me, let me read the passage and then we'll spend a little bit of time just reviewing what we've seen and we'll look at this. Hebrews 10 verses 11 through 13, and really we're focusing on verses 12 and 13. The author to the Hebrews writes, <clears throat> Every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. So we see here the timing of his reign, and we see also the character of his reign. And, and those, that's what we want to focus on this morning. Now, we have been looking at the many ways in which God has loved us as a means to strengthen our affection for him. We know the Spirit of God gives us love, and we should love him by nature because we have a new nature, but we've also seen that that love can be nurtured. So we want to nurture it by considering again all the, the, the wonderful ways that God has revealed His love to us. Now, currently we're looking at the covenant of grace, and that is that agreement between the members of the Godhead in all, from all eternity, before there was time, before there was anything that existed besides God, where the Father chose us and sent, this is His plan, that He, he chose us and He planned to send His Son for us, the Son agreed to come and do what was necessary to justify us, and the Spirit agreed that He would apply what Jesus did to those whom the Father has chosen and those whom the Lord Jesus came to save. Now, Jonathan Edwards had another way of describing the covenant of grace, and I think it's also something we should bear in mind. He puts, he puts it this way, the Father is the one who gives the price of our redemption. He gives his, his only Son. The Son comes into the world to pay the price of our redemption. Okay, he gives His life for us. And the Spirit is the one who was purchased by the Son. You know, we often think of the Son purchasing us. He redeems us, you know, from God's justice, essentially. He, he saves us by paying the price that justice deserved for our crimes. But there was something else that Jesus also purchased, and that is the Spirit. Okay, unless, if Jesus hadn't done this work, the Spirit could not come and dwell within us. And Jonathan Edwards put it this way because he wanted to give equal glory to the Holy Spirit. You know, we think about the Father giving His Son, the Son doing all this work, and then the Spirit comes and He applies what Jesus did. And that doesn't seem to really honor him as, as he should be honored. But if he is that which is purchased for us by Christ, he is the gift that Jesus gives to us, then that honors him. Okay? That work that he would do in our souls to give us a new heart so that we might love, that we might trust, that we might obey him. Now, we've seen that this covenant provides a mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ. And remember, a mediator is somebody who stands between two parties to reconcile us. And in this case, Jesus stands between God and us to bring us back together, okay, to do what is necessary to bring peace. Now, He, we've seen, is the only one who could have done this because our mediator to redeem us or to uh, reconcile us had to be God. 
The payment that he made had to be, again, enough to pay for our great crimes. He also had to be man in order to stand in our place and to make the payment on our behalf. So we, we've seen that. But we've also seen that there's another way of describing this work of mediator, and that is that Jesus, as our mediator, does three things which are expressed by three offices. And so far, we've looked at two of those, okay? Jesus had to show us the way of salvation as our prophet. Maybe you, if you were listening to my prayer, I, I also uh, reflected that. Uh, this is something that Jesus was doing through the Old Testament prophets, uh, even from the beginning. This is something that Jesus did when he came into the world during his earthly ministry. He was preaching the gospel. And this is something that he continues to do today through his word as we read it, through his ministers as they preach it, proclaim it, through us as we evangelize, and as we encourage each other to follow his word. Jesus is exercising his office as prophet, as our mediator, uh, in all these various ways. We saw, secondly, that he had to offer a sacrifice and that he prays for us as our priest. Again, he alone could have done this, the only sacrifice that could pay for our sins. But we also saw how he intercedes, how he prays for us from heaven, that he might keep us in the grace of God, because we continue to sin. You know, he forgives us, again, past, present, and future sins, but the reason why they're forgiven is because we're continually confessing them and Jesus is continually praying and interceding for us, pleading his sacrifice on our behalf that we might be you know, kept in his grace. Now again, Christ is our priest, Christ is our prophet. Think about what God has given us. Think about that in light of what we deserve. Okay, remember that mercy is where God doesn't give us what we deserve, but he, he, you know, he, he basically doesn't punish us. He doesn't give us justice. But grace is giving us something we not only don't deserve, but we deserve just the opposite. Okay, we deserve damnation and hell, every single one of us as we come into the world. But the Father gave us a mediator who declares to us the gospel, comes that there might be a gospel, that there might be forgiveness, and we are saved through this work. And for that, we ought to be thankful and we ought to love him. And really, how can we really appreciate this? Only by meditating on it, by thinking again about what we deserve and what he has given us instead. This, you know, for this, we should love him so, so very much. Now, this morning, we want to consider the third thing that Jesus had to do for us as our mediator. He needed, as our shorter catechism reminds us, to subdue us to himself, to rule over us and defend us, and to conquer his and our enemies as our king. Okay? So, as our mediator, Jesus has also been given to us, or has, has been given this office as king in order to do these particular things. And I want you to, to bear in mind here that all the things that I've mentioned, subduing us, ruling and defending us, conquering his and our enemies, all benefit us. They all benefit us. The Lord is doing these things that we might, you know, that he might reveal the glory of his grace, but he is doing them for us so that, that we might, again, honor him for this great grace and mercy that he has shown. Now, the first thing I want us to see is the timing, okay? the timing of Jesus' kingship, and that's important because there are many today who do not believe that Jesus is currently reigning. We need to see that Jesus is reigning now. After he died on the cross, after he rose again from the dead, after he spent another 40 days in this world teaching his disciples about the kingdom of heaven, he ascended into heaven. The author to the Hebrews writes in our passage, but he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God. So after he died, rose, and he ascended, 
He sat at the right hand of God. This is the beginning of what we call Christ's mediatorial kingship. You know, his reign as our mediator. Now, as God, we know that the Son of God has ruled from the beginning. You know, God has always ruled. He is sovereign. But what we mean by this is that Jesus now reigns as our mediator. I hope we realize there's a difference now in, in our Lord Jesus Christ. The, the name Jesus really only applies to the man, Christ Jesus, the human nature of Christ, who is God and man. But the Son of God has existed from all eternity. So what we're saying is he's ruled as the Son of God from all eternity, but now he rules as the God-man who sits at the right hand of God. This is one of the rewards you know, that he receives for his work of redemption. Now, as I've said, many today believe that this reign has not yet begun. There's actually a camp that's called dispensationalism that teaches that, and I know that because I went to a college that was a dispensational college, and they continually hammered at this particular point. They believe that his reign will not begin until he returns to set up his 1,000-year reign on earth, during which time he will bring unprecedented blessings. But I want, just, I want us to note that the author to the Hebrews tells us that this reign has already begun, that it started at the time of his ascension. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, not 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, or however many years later it's going to be before Jesus returns. But after he made the sacrifice, after he ascended, he sat down. Now, this sitting at the right hand of God was his coronation, okay? This was the day in which he was crowned when he began his absolute rule over the world as the mediator. Now, this is an event that the Lord was speaking about for, for many years. We, we read it in Psalm 110, the promise that the Lord had, had made that David's son would sit on his throne and that God would subdue these his enemies under him, but there's other places where it's mentioned as well. Think about Daniel. In Daniel chapter 7, I think it's one of the most powerful uh, prophecies regarding this. But this is what Daniel saw in, in, um, in one of his visions. In Daniel 7, verses 13 through 14, he says, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. Now notice, a son of man, uh, by the way, son of man, is that's why Jesus calls himself the son of man, more times than he calls himself the son of God. It's a technical term that refers to the Messiah. And that's, that's whom Daniel was referring to here when he said that the son of man was coming, but notice he was coming on the clouds. Do you, do you see something here that's familiar? Because when Jesus ascended, you know, the disciples watched him go up, a cloud received him and then took him out of their sight. Well, what happened after that? That's what Daniel's telling us. Now, in the remainder of these two verses, and he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. If we had time to, th to examine this a little bit uh, further, we would also see the timing of the setting up of this kingdom in that uh, earlier in Daniel's prophecy, when uh, Nebuchadnezzar, you know, has the golden statue made and it's based upon the dream that he had. But remember the dream of the statue with the various metals and then the feet of iron mixed with clay and how the stone, you know, cut without hands smashes the feet of the statue, the statue tumbles over, it turns into dust, the wind drives it away, but the stone becomes a great mountain that fills the whole earth. And the interpretation of that is in the days of these kings that are represented by the ten toes, which is Rome, God sets up a kingdom which will endure forever. And that's what it, the Lord is telling Daniel about right here, that same kingdom. It's the kingdom of Christ, the mediatorial kingdom of Christ. When he ascended, it was to become ruler over the entire earth. 
he becomes the king over the earth. Remember how Satan tempted him and said, if you worship me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the earth? Well, Jesus knew he was going to receive those kingdoms, but it was going to be in the way that his father had ordained, and this is it. Now, some would point to the evil that is going on in the world today and would argue that Jesus really can't be reigning because his reign is characterized as a reign of peace and, and prosperity. You know, when you, that's what post-millennialism is all about, right? Is that there's going to be this wonderful golden age where uh, there's going to be longevity and there's going to be peace and no longer any warfare and, and all of these blessings, even, you know, the nations of the earth worshiping God. But we do need to remember that God has been reigning over the world from the very beginning, hasn't he? I mean, he is the sovereign, regardless of of what we might have thought. He is the one who is in the ultimate control of all things, and yet we see that God has allowed evil during his reign. So the fact that God is reigning, or that Christ is reigning, and that there's still evil in the world, there, there's no contradiction here. This evening, we're going to see why it is that God allows evil in the world, and why he is, he is actually going to allow it for still a period of time under Christ's rule until his kingdom comes with power. Okay, we're going to look at that this evening. But what we should see, based on what the author says next in our passage, is that during Jesus' reign, his enemies are being subdued. And that should make a difference in what's happening during the present time. Because he says this, but he having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. Okay? One of the rewards that Jesus receives for his work is the promise of the Father to vanquish his enemies. Now, these enemies are not going to be fully vanquished until just before the second coming, okay? Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 25 and 26, and this is our meditation that I read earlier. Now, listen to this very carefully. For he must reign until he, that is the Father, has put all his enemies, that is Christ's enemies, under his feet, under Christ's feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death, okay? Now, once all of his enemies are, de are defeated and subdued, Paul says he will return to defeat the last enemy. And he goes on to tell us exactly how that enemy is going to be defeated, death, and that is through the resurrection. He says in verse, verse 54, but when the perishable will have put on the imperishable and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. So this is the point I told you earlier that this one of the presbyters who was examining me for, uh, for ordination who fell off his chair practically when I told him that this has nothing to do with what we're talking about this morning um, <clears throat> shows my ignorance. But the point he was trying to point out to me here was this. Christ is reigning right now. His enemies are being subdued under his feet and the last enemy that will be subdued is death, and that will happen when he comes again. That means that before he comes again, all of his other enemies are going to be subdued under his feet. Okay, now we usually think of Christ coming, at least the, the church thinks of, of Christ and, and the whole situation is that the church is going to continue to go down, 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 and, and the world is going to sort of rise up against it. And when it looks like the church is just about to be destroyed, well, then Christ comes and he destroys all of his enemies at the second coming. But that's not the picture we get here. We see his enemies being subdued from the time Christ begins to reign until the, near the end of his reign. All of them are going to be subdued during that time frame. And then he's going to return to subdue the very last enemy, which is death at the resurrection. In other words, to basically the icing on the cake, to finish it off. He's going to come and defeat the very last enemy, but they're all going to be defeated before that. Now that, to me, suggests that maybe we should expect to see something better happening in this world than, than the church being surrounded by this overwhelming force that's going to extinguish it, okay? 
So this is the time of the subduing of his enemies. What should we expect to see? And I think we can kind of categorize everything Christ does as our king under that question. First of all, we should expect to see Christ's sheep being brought home. Okay? The first thing the catechism reminds us of is that he subdues us to himself and us are believers. Okay? Uh, this is the first way he subdues his enemies is by giving them a new heart by his Holy Spirit so that they willingly bend the knee to him. And that's what he's done for us. Remember what we, what we saw before, we were born enemies of God. We were born in the enemy's camp. We may not have thought we were, but that's what the Bible says. We were in, in rebellion against God. We hated God, just like the rest of the world. Paul even puts himself in that category in Ephesians 2, verse 3, where he says, we all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind and we're by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Paul says we would not submit to God, and he says the reason we would not was because we could not. Paul writes in Romans 8, verse 7, the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And that's why Jesus, and, and hopefully we understand this by now, but why Jesus said to those who followed him after he fed, you know, the 5,000 and they all followed him for another meal, he says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And he, what he meant by that is no one can come to me savingly and trust in me unless the Father who sent me compels him, Okay drags him, not against his will, but compels him by a change of heart. You see, God did that for us. He overcame our hatred in, in really two different ways. He, he sent us the gospel through one of his ambassadors. You know, one of his, he spoke through one of his people to us. He shared the gospel with us, and he gave us his spirit. Okay? He caused us to be born again, like Jesus told Nicodemus. Unless you're born again, you can't see and enter the kingdom of heaven. Uh, Paul talks about it in Ephesians 2, verses 4 and 6. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead and unable you know, to, to come to God, unable to submit to his law, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him. So what should we expect to see, first of all, during this time frame of uh, Christ's reign, when we should expect him to be subduing his sheep to himself, turning those who were formerly his enemies into those who love him, who willingly worship him and follow him. Now, we should secondly expect to see our king ruling over us as king, and again, that's something we don't often think about. Well, we should be thinking about it because he does rule over us. And the way he does that is through his law, okay? He's given us the law to guide us. But let's not forget what that law is, what, what Paul calls it. And this is the way we should look at it. It's not the 10 things we don't want to do, okay? Shouldn't, we shouldn't look at it that way. And we should never look at it as the 10 things we must do in our own strength to make it to heaven that's, Paul tells us that's not why the law was given, okay? It was really given to show us that we can't do them. But they are the 10 things that, that really explain to us what love is, how to love God and how to love our neighbors. So Christ has given this as our rule, and he does tell us to do it, but what he's commanding us to do is to love, right? Love him and to love our neighbor. So he tells us that. He tells us what to do through the law. He tells us through the elders, you know, because elders have been uh, actually ordained in the church in order to administer the rule of Christ, not, not their own will, but the will of our, our, of our loving king. That's why the author to the Hebrews says this, obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. 
so the, the, the leaders or the shepherds in Christ's church are simply trying to get God's people to, to walk in that path of love uh, for their good and for the honor of Christ. And they're seeking to do it faithfully because they have to give an account. But that's, again, one of the ways that Christ ministers his kingly rule. And, of course, he does it when we open our Bibles and read what he calls us to do. And, again, that's how we read about the law. One th another thing we don't often think about is that our, uh, that our Lord Jesus Christ as our king is also training us to be his soldiers in his army. I mean, a king has, has an army, doesn't he? And we are that army. Uh, and we are to be engaged in spiritual warfare that's going on between the two kingdoms. And we are to be engaged in this warfare for his honor and his glory. And also for the sake of the sheep he has yet to subdue to himself. And so our Lord Jesus Christ is our king, trains us. He trains us by teaching us through the different gifts that he has given to the church. Remember Ephesians 4, verses 11 through 13? And he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints. So there's that rule, but there's also the equipping of the saints to the, uh, excuse me, for the work of service, again, in Christ's army is one way of looking at it, to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. He trains us for warfare. Uh, as a good um, leader, he also disciplines his soldiers. Uh, one of the ways he does that, of course, is, is through church discipline. Uh, we read in um, Matthew 18, verse 17, uh, how we are to go about um, when, we, when a brother or sister is in sin. We go to them privately. If they don't repent, we take one or two more. If they don't repent, we bring it to the church. If he refuses to listen to them, that is, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax gatherer. Okay? So there's church discipline. And then he also disciplines us personally. Um, uh, Hebrews 12, verse 7. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? Okay, so he trains us, he disciplines us, and then he also gives us incentives. And by the way, those are also incentives. Uh, you, you don't want to be disciplined by the Lord, that's one thing. But he also gives us rewards for faithfulness. Revelation 22, verse 12. Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. So Jesus rules over us, and he trains us as our king uh, for spiritual warfare. But he also, as our king, defends us. And this, this again, is a very, um, a very wonderful blessing that he gives to us. Remember how when... Um, that, that uh, group of soldiers came out to arrest Jesus and how Jesus went out from among his disciples and he stood in front of them. And he says, if it's me you're after, then let these others go, okay? How the shepherd is protecting his sheep, okay? Jesus defends us as king. He did that to his, for his disciples on earth, but he also continues to do that for us from heaven so that he will make sure that nothing will ever take us from him. Some of the most comforting words penned by the Apostle Paul are in Romans 8, verses 38 through 39, where he says this, For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Again, Jesus defends us as our king. He will not let us go, and he will make sure that on the way, everything that he does allow in our lives, that it will work together for our good. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. By the way, that has to do with trials, okay? And we've been looking at trials uh, from the book of James. Those things he brings maybe 
are, they're not good in and of themselves. The, the sickness, the affliction, the enemies, whatever it is we may have to face, the financial difficulties, the, the even rebellious children, uh, that happens as well. Those things are not good in and of themselves, but the Lord allows them so that he might work good in our lives through these things. Now, finally, along with the Lord's defending us, we should remember, too, that we should expect to see his enemies being subdued, okay? This is the promise the Father gave him, as we saw earlier in 1 Corinthians 15, as we read in our call to worship. Uh, let me just read the call to worship again. Psalm 110, verses one, just verses 1 and 2. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion, saying, rule in the midst of of your enemies. And again, our scripture reading, ask of me and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. And let's not forget what Paul writes, remember in Philippians 2 verses 9 and 11, after he talks about how Christ being in the form of God humbles himself and takes upon himself our nature and humbles himself even to the point of death. And then he says, because of this, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's simply... Again, uh, reflecting the promise we have in, in Psalm 110, what the author to the Hebrews says earlier with regard to, you know, his, he sits at God's right hand until all of his enemies uh, are subdued under his feet. He has a promise from the Father that as he reigns, every knee will bow to him. And I don't think it's going to happen all at once at the very end. This is something that is happening progressively, Okay. He is ruling and reigning now while his father is subduing his enemies. And, you know, as bad as things look right now, it's not as bad as it was many centuries ago. I mean, there was a time when the kingdom of heaven was centered in, in just a, a few in Israel, right? Uh, and on the day of Pentecost, there weren't that many people in the upper room. But think about all the believers that exist today and think about how Christianity continues to expand today. Think about those who are willingly submitting to Christ and think about what is yet ahead as this promise is fulfilled. So, yes, the kingdom of heaven does, in a certain sense, you know, ebb and flow. We have seen the great awakening. We've seen times when the kingdom of heaven powerfully intrudes into the world uh, when God wills it. But there is still, even though there is that up and down, there is still this progression that is ongoing. And that's something we should expect to see. Not the church spiraling down into a pit of despair, but rather spiraling upwards as Christ's enemies are subdued under his feet. That, again, is what our Lord is doing as our King, subduing our enemies and his enemies under his feet. So, as our king, he subdued us by his word and spirit. Otherwise, we'd still be rebels on our way to destruction. As our king, he trains us for spiritual warfare so that we would be faithful soldiers in his, in his army. And he defends us so that we won't be casualties in this war. And he conquers all of his enemies so that they will no longer be a threat to us. Now, this is what our mediator does for us. This is the one that the Father has given to us out of his infinite love. And this is what the mediator out of his infinite love has done for us. Now, again, these things are happening uh, all around us. And we're really not aware of them, I think, unless by faith we see them. We need to be constantly reminded of these things by you know, hearing it or by reading of Scripture but we need to bear these things in mind because they are true and they are real 
And that heart of love is beating, as it were, towards us, both from the Father and the Son. The Spirit of God is working within us. And all of this love that the Father and the Son and the Spirit has shown us needs to be reciprocated by us. We need to see it and respond to it by loving Him in return, and particularly this morning, by willingly submitting to His gracious rule. Well, let's, let's think about that, and as we do, let's pray, and let's ask the Lord to prepare us to come to the table, because remember, the table is for those who have heard the voice of Christ, who have received the sacrifice that Jesus has made, which is pictured for us in the table, but who are also submitting to the rule of Christ because we love Him. So as we prepare to come to the table, let's examine our hearts. Let's make sure that we're dealing with any areas of our lives where we haven't been loving Him. Let's repent of those sins and renew our love and our commitment to follow Him uh, this morning. So let, let's spend just a few moments in prayer.